I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel, Yams Do Not Exist. Um, this one refers to the Beaverbrook exhibit um, that was in Winnipeg uh, some years back, and a uh, few years ago. And um, it also refers to uh, basically Beaverbrook syndrome, which is a variation on Stendhal syndrome, which uh, for people who know, it's uh, people in the Uffizi Gallery in Italy who have um, they have an, a, a sickness, a reaction of being overwhelmed to too much art. And so they're, they're, they have a special place in the hospital for them. Maybe not right now, but um, yes, they, they do normally. So this is about a, an illness that is caused by looking at too much in the Beaverbrook um, exhibit. Beaverbrook and the bilious attack. That's what this excerpt is called. Farinata leaned on the side of the footbridge and watched the lone train car pass. Aloof of the locomotive were a swallowtail perched upon a dandelion, a goat's beard in full bloom, and a pelican in the Assiniboine River. He suspected that these natural elements had their spiritual counterparts in Dali's equestrian fantasy. Not that he could boast a noble profile seated side saddle upon a palomino charger with a falcon perched atop his gloved arm. Yet, the painted creatures in the shadows, a frog, a rabbit, a squirrel, a salamander, and two deer, corresponded to the inhabitants of his own laid-back portrait. That's a reference to uh, Salvador Dali's portrait of Lady Dunn, in which we find the general disposition of our poet friend. Surely to confirm this fancy, a red squirrel shot up a tree to hoard its choice nut, just as a small cottontail stopped to reflect on its palatial edifice of unadulterated burdock. His internal chronometer gave him a quarter of an hour in which to dwell on some metaphysical trifle or other. Why not crouch over Omen's Creek and wheeze out the death knell for literature? Bless him. Farinata had found an environment that was reasonably pliant to his philosophical stance, the epitome of standing fast, to be in continual motion without becoming a function of goals or aims. Yes, work he could, and work he had wrangled for himself, yet in the middle of the road of his life he was no longer reliable when it came to chucking a sabot into the gears to better the conditions of his brethren. His nocturnal stint I should mention there that sabot, chucking the sabot into the gears is where sabotage comes from. His nocturnal stint at the post office during the holiday rush had not resulted in a single incident of pulling a Bartleby or going postal. Though he had avoided becoming one of the walking undead like some of his colleagues, he found that for a man of letters in the age of new media, there were few places to turn. In a pinch, he could be counted on to pluck a gem out of the slush. There was no evidence to the contrary. However, due to the exponential increase in writing programs, there was way more money, still not much, in rejection, something of a growth industry. We cannot pinpoint the root cause, either too deeply buried in our protagonist's unhappy childhood or under heaps of misdirected adulation, for why Farinata should find that he experienced few greater sensations comparable to those of papery dreams crinkling underfoot. One trade secret he would take to his incineration was that a good editor never takes a step without a gun dog at his or her side. If the publishing house does not provide one, then one will appear within a fortnight. For gun dogs, you see, there are also few places to turn. Once a letter-sized envelope has been opened and your furry friend has established it does not contain a treat, he or she will go to work in a flurry of nose and eyes. A muddy paw print may signify submission of interest. On the other hand, slobber is not so good. The latter might be a cue for Farinata to begin the slow Baroque dance over the query letter, preferably a torturous minuet or slow saraband. Ringing phones were for the birds, but over the years he had learned that one must always answer a barking dog. <laughs>